Well, good morning and thank you. Uh, our moderator mentioned the word lucky this morning. And I have to say uh, many lucky things have happened to me in my lifetime. But one of them is being in the city that was the birthplace of On Point. And I think we owe you a great deal of, of thanks. And uh, the, the courage to take on difficult questions with both sides represented, I think, is a model. So if I could have the presentation up on the screen. Ah, thank you. Um, so we're here today to talk about ideas. Uh, climate forms a centerpiece, but it's in the context of both energy and higher education. And I don't know how far I'll get through before I'm stalked from, from, the, from the left here. Uh, uh, but I want to point out that uh, much of my frustration over what the national response has been to the linkage of climate and energy led me one morning to wake up and realize that I was a fundamental part of the problem because I teach freshman chemistry fairly religiously and I realized I was teaching it in the mode that keeps chemistry separate from physics but more importantly the physical sciences separate from societal objectives and societal responsibility. And I think there are major changes that need to take place in university education across the country that draw students into these physical sciences as an integrated part of university education. And it's clear the way the country votes now, um, as it may leave you uh, shocked, uh, the point, I think, is that the universities bear a clear responsibility for graduating students who actually integrate the physical sciences with the societal objectives. So let's start out and, and talk about climate. And the issue here is recasting the problem by looking at numbers that matter. And as I will point out um, in, in a moment, every time I hear the word global warming, I shudder because it carries with it a connotation that doesn't capture the true essence of what's going on within the system. In fact, the word global warming implies a slow change moving into the future, a change that's reversible whenever we decide to do it. In fact, the demographics demonstrate that most people want their backyard warmer. They're moving from New England to the Southwest, from the Dakotas to the South. And I think this is a fundamental misstatement of the problem. So if I don't get to anything else, that's the, the key message I want to pass on here. Energy technology and the pathways, changing the path forward, this intimate link between climate change and energy, uh, when we look at the numbers, as we will, there are profound concerns about the rate at which this is changing. And I don't want to leave uh, a, a message that, that, that doesn't make very clear that there are energy technology pathways that can be executed very quickly and very effectively. And finally, this issue of university education, this breakdown in communication that bifurcates the scientific domain from the liberal arts within the freshman year. And that separation continues not only through the society of undergraduate education, and, and I know it well from my university, but it maps directly onto the future after graduation. And there are studies demonstrating how, how little is understood by college graduates across the country, including my university. So how does the climate work? This is the first point we want to make. How does energy flow into and out of the climate system? We know that we receive all of the energy that matters from the sun. We receive it in the visible where we can see it. And the amount of energy we receive is about one and a half million trillion kilowatt hours. Now we've already heard about kilowatt hours this morning. You, you buy electrical power, but you pay for energy, the amount of energy you, you use in units of kilowatt hours. So that's the canonical and most useful unit of energy. So we receive now uh, um, one, one and a half million trillion, you know, the military budget's a trillion dollars and the population of Boston's a million people, but you multiply those two numbers together, 
to come out with this huge amount of energy that we receive from the sun. About a third of it's reflected back, never enters the climate system, and it's reflected back in the visible, and that's why we can see this beautiful Earth from space, which has changed many people's perspectives. So it's the, the remaining two-thirds, the one million trillion uh, kilowatt hours that's absorbed into the climate system, but it's radiated back out to the blackness of space from the skin of the Earth's atmosphere. And it's that balance, one of which we see and we know, and the other that we do not see, but it balances exquisitely that incoming and outgoing energy. So if we cut through this system and dissect it and look at it from the side, we have the same 1.5, 10 to the 18, or 1.5 million trillion kilowatt hours coming in, a third is reflected back, but somewhat counterintuitively, the amount of energy cycling between the Earth's surface and the atmosphere is almost twice what enters it. And that sounds peculiar, but we're all sitting here with clothes on, our body is radiating infrared, and our clothes are radiating infrared back into us as well as the walls of this room. If we didn't receive that infrared radiation coming back in, we'd have to eat 30,000 calories of food energy a day to maintain our body temperature. We only eat 2,000, and that represents that exquisite balance between infrared radiation going out and what's coming back. The Earth's atmosphere is exactly the same thing. So this is a very important number. This is so two million trillion kilowatt hours of circulating energy. We can't see it, but it's there, it's potent, and it's powerful. And by the way, it's 10,000 times more than the total energy consumed by all of humanity to sustain its economic structure internationally. That's the number against which we compare all others. So the key, this is the key point. It's the net flow of heat. It's the net flow of heat from that circulating radiation that determines our future, that guides the future course of events. And if we could just see in the infrared, we would vote very differently. In fact, I, there's a filmmaker that's following me, and I think it would be very good to create a film of the world in the infrared rather than the visible because it would be a stunning picture and it would change our perception of what is actually occurring in the climate structure. So the next point is alternatively stated, and this is what I hinted at before, global warming fails to capture the imperative. It's the flow of heat into the system, not the change in temperature. And one of the primary reasons for that is the ocean is a huge reservoir for heat. We can pump massive amounts of heat into the ocean and it doesn't change the temperature. It covers 70% of the Earth's surface and it hides the real effect of what's going on. And so, as I pointed out before, every time I hear that term, I cringe. Another way of looking at this is to say a one degree Celsius increase in global mean temperatures to the climate system as a 3% default rate is to the mortgage home mortgages within the national financial structure. Who would have believed that a small fraction of one component of, of the financial structure could bring down the international uh, economic structure the way it did? Um, so we have to be very careful about the way we formulate it. Another interesting thing is that if you try to track money through the international financial system, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. Tracking heat through the climate structure is actually some, somewhat simpler than that. Um, and of course, the other point is that human beings created the financial structure. They didn't create the climate structure. So let's look at the power that's involved in this. So the focus here is on irreversible change in the climate structure. This is what we really care about. It's those changes which, when they are executed, prevent us from coming back to where we were before. And what sets the time scale for this irreversible change are these feedbacks that, that Tom mentioned in the introduction. The feedbacks that couple the subsystems of the climate together. And that's what I want to describe here briefly. So first of all, is there an ex example of such a feedback? Do, do, or is this just a model? Is this just a calculation? And the answer to that resides within the Arctic. And so th these are microwave data taken from the satellite looking down on the Earth starting in January of 2007. And 
you can see that we're now work, working our way through the year into March and April. This is the floating ice of the Arctic Ocean. That's Greenland, and over here is Alaska. We're going into June, July, August, and ending on the 16th of September. Now, if I had showed you these data in 1955, on, on the middle of September, it would have been locked in all through the Arctic Basin. But more than that, the ice would have been three and a half meters thick, and we know that because we have detailed data analyses from nuclear submarines that were cruising under the ice cap in the 50s, and they were very concerned about the shape, the topography of the bottom of the ice. They had exquisite uh, de detailed information. If I looked, uh, showed you this uh, in 1980, when, when these observations were started, most of the Arctic Ocean was still locked in. So, wow. <laughs> okay. So, this example then, which I'm going to jump to the next one. The question is, if we look at this circulating energy between the Earth's surface and the atmosphere, what fraction of that circulating energy was required to melt half of the Arctic ice cap in the last 30 years? And the answer to that is, against this background of 210 to the 18 kilowatt hours per year, only 310 to the 13 kilowatt hours of energy were required to execute the melting of that ice system. That is, that's one part in 50,000 of the circulating energy. Tiny, tiny shifts in the background energy is all that's required to fundamentally change the system. And, God, this is, sorry about this. So let's just ask, why do we care? Well, some of you probably saw the New York Times on Tuesday that showed, not in the science section, but in the business section, that Russia is investing in all of the opening ports along its northern coast, and opening those ports so that they can ship oil back and forth across the Arctic, shortening the distance between the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean. This is the Northwest Passage, of course, that, that controlled and, and dominated the searches in the 15th century. But there's another reason why we care. And that is that as this ice recedes in the Arctic, the floating ice, the region around the Arctic begins to melt. And contained within that, uh, the soils around particularly Siberia and northern Alaska reside the permafrost capture of carbon dioxide and of methane. And methane is contained in these exquisite ice structures the methane molecule actually enters the void in this molecular structure. And not only does it capture the methane, but it compresses it. So a, a, a liter of, of this material, and this is, this is a worldwide, there's twice as much chemical energy tied up in this source than in all petroleum, coal, and natural gas reserves. And if you bring this up and, and touch a cigarette lighter to it, It'll sit there and burn a long time because one liter of this compresses 170 liters of methane within its structure. And as the Arctic Basin begins to warm, this begins to release methane and carbon dioxide. So if we look at this receding ice cap um, leading to the melting of the zones in the periphery of the Arctic Ocean, this is what it does. This on the vertical axis from the International Panel on Climate Change tracks the amount of carbon added to the atmosphere by all combustion worldwide against time, 1990, 95, 2000, 2000. This was released in 2007. This is the report that got the Nobel Peace Prize, Peace Prize in the fall of 2007. So the, the highest release rate of carbon issued in that report is exceeded by the actual numbers. This is the amount released 2005, 6, 7, 8. But a half percent melt rate in these systems adds that much carbon each year to the system. This is a profoundly positive, powerful feedback in the climate structure. And it's something that we're extremely concerned about. Next example, if we look down on this system, here's the floating ice. Now, when floating ice melts, it doesn't raise sea level. 
I mean, if you have ice cubes in your glass, you'll notice that it, it melts, but the level of water doesn't rise in the glass because of the density difference. But this is Greenland. Greenland contains a, an amount of ice that would raise sea level, of course, worldwide by seven meters. It's 3,000 meters thick, 9,000 feet thick through the core of Greenland. If it melts because it's on land, that does raise sea level. And so let's take a quick look at what's happening to Greenland. These are the melt zones in 1992 around the edge. And at that time, it was believed that this was simply a small amount of water that would roll off the back of this huge glacial structure. 2005, this melting water began to become more and more prevalent. But the important thing was what happened to that water. It didn't roll off slowly into the ocean. It actually goes down through fissures. These fissures go down 2,000 feet to the base rock, and it begins to lubricate the bond between the ice structure and the bedrock. And Greenland is stable only because it's retained horizontally by that bond. When you begin to release that bond, it expands outward and downward because not only is it very deep in the center, but its architecture is very similar to a medieval cathedral. Very high, very narrow, very heavy, and they only can remain fixed by these flying buttresses. Greenland is exactly the same. So we now know that it's the dynamics of the breakup of that ice structure, not a large monolithic melting ice cube that's the proper model for this. So let's take a look at what this means. Let's just pick on central Cambridge. So here's the Charles River. This is the Charles Basin. The dam is down here. It's got about half a, a meter over high tide. So I, th this yellow zone is the Harvard campus. And so if we add uh, a meter of sea level height, you can see that there's significant encroachment. The athletic fields, the region where Harvard was about to drop $10 billion on, on real estate development is only a meter above sea level. The, the undergraduate houses are situated along here. They're called river houses, and this brings a whole new dimension to the word <laughs> river house. But let's add three meters. Um, three meters, that's just 40% of Greenland. I haven't talked about the Antarctic and I don't have time to. This is three meters. Now you can see major encroachment. And I, the only silver lining I see to this is that MIT goes under before Harvard. <laughs> Other than that, there's no good news about this. Okay, we switch from sea level to water supplies. Now the third region of massive cryospheric mass resides in Tibet. There's the Arctic, the Antarctic, and Tibet. And those Tibetan glaciers feed water systems of India and China. Particularly sensitive is India. China fortunately has some rain that intervenes to, to boost uh, river flow. That's not true of China. But even, even, that's not true of India, but even China uh, is now coming to recognize that even though their power generation from coal deposits nitrate, sulfate, heavy metal, and carbon at nearly toxic levels, if they lose their water supply, that's a completely different story from a civic and political perspective. And they have to be extremely careful about this. And the illusion was already this morning about how avant-garde China is with respect to the development of alternative energy. So now let's move on to the next subject. Um, by the way, uh, am I at 19 minutes? What? <laughs> well, that's good. I'm about a quarter of the way through. <laughs> so so I'll, I'll end. <laughs> yeah, actually, why not? I mean, you know, this is, this is the really exciting part of the talk, but Let's end up with this. This issue about the responsibility of universities and the responsibility of the physical sciences. And of course, the very structure of freshman physics and chemistry was built on the premise of discovering scientific talent 
by making those courses very difficult, very dry, starting out with vector calculus the first week, setting up a boot camp, and if you didn't make it through the boot camp, you could go anywhere else you wanted. And when society only needs five or six percent of its people to understand physics, chemistry, and so on, that, that was just fine. But universities have to look forward five years, 10 years, 20 years, and ask, what do graduates today need to know to enter proactively into this world that's changing so quickly? And when you ask that question, you recognize that what they walk out of on graduation day reflects directly back on what they take as freshmen. And particularly, what technical forces are shaping the modern world? Where are the frontiers of innovation? for professional endeavors, but also not just technology, international economics, government ethics, public health, law, and education. If you don't understand the fundamentals of what go in, go, go, goes into the scientific part of this, you can't function. And finally, which public policy strategies are based on science, sound scientific rationale and which ones are not? So thank you very much. Yeah.